afternoon. Thank you. Well, one of the things I liked last week about what Jason did, uh, his style is so different than mine. And I'm not, not pandering to Jason, but uh, if, if you know, probably no one else thought about this, or maybe you did. Uh, but the section 12 through 20 was on original sin in the Westminster Catechism. And I probably would have made a production out of that saying, well, it's, we're going to make a transition here and we're, we're going to Christ the Redeemer, questions 21 through 38. But Jason did it seamlessly and didn't even bring it up. And, and I was thinking this week how um, that's kind of analogous to, to, to the way it happens in Scripture. The, the whole Bible is that that story, his plan of salvation, but it's but it's still seamless. He had the he had that plan of redemption, even from the garden, from the foundations of the earth. Um, so he, as as the original sin occurred, um, likewise, it was a seamless transition. God already had a plan in place. Um, so that was just something I thought about a lot this week. <clears throat> Jason talked about the two distinct natures of Christ, the humanity and the divinity. And we're going to talk some more about that this week. In fact, of course, this whole section on Redeemer, um, Christ the Redeemer, there's going to be a lot of discussion about that. Um, we're going to go ahead and look through the scripture passages this morning, the, the proofs for this, because as I've said, almost every time I've taught, it's, that's what the catechism is about. It's about pointing us back to scripture. Can you guys hear me okay? I'm not used to wearing this earbud. And it messes with my my head a little. Um, but we're looking at questions 22 and 23. And 22 being about how Christ actually came to us uh, via the, the, the virgin birth and the other surrounding um, circumstances there. And then question 23 being about the three offices that, that Christ executes for us in the church. <clears throat> so question 22, how did Christ, being the son of God, become man? And the answer, Christ, the Son of God, became man by taking to himself a true body and a reasonable soul, being conceived by the power of the Holy Ghost in the womb of the Virgin Mary and born of her yet without sin. And I know this is a fairly simple doctrine for, for most of you in this room. But, um, so I think that's, that's why I enjoy going back to the scripture proofs. So. The ones that I kind of highlighted there on your outline, and you'll see on the back of that point, too. You don't have to flip there now necessarily, but there's a table in the back that the author had in here that's just directly from the book. This week's book that is used for a and I really like that table. Um, but the highlights of the two questions, we, won't, we don't necessarily have to look those up because it's right there in front of you. Although I apologize, I was lazy and I left those in the King James Version. Um, <clears throat> For anyone that doesn't enjoy reading in King James, but um, can someone look up Philippians 2 7? <clears throat> and someone look up Hebrews 2 17. And 1 27. Start there instead of getting too carried away. That's asking you to remember a lot. If you have, when, when someone finds just go ahead and jump to verse 7. Steady empty yourself by assuming the form of a servant, taking on the likeness of humanity, when he had come as a man. Thank you. And you kind of see what the, I'm sure you, you guys have noticed this, is that that's why I copied them straight from the catechism. I like the way they've got like an A, B, and C, the subscripts and superscripts there where you can tell which scriptures are pointing to which section and exactly why these these church leaders wrote the, the catechism questions the way they did. Um, <clears throat> does anyone have Hebrews 17? Oh, did I say 17? Verse 17. Can you also do 17? Yeah, that's good. It does. It's it's listed there. That's good. Seventeen also, please. For this reason, he had to be made like his brothers in every way, in order that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in service to God, and that he might make atonement for our sins. Thank you. And that that does a great job of highlighting how else could he 
how else could he mediate for us if he wasn't one for us? We'll talk more about that. Does anyone have Luke 127? Thank you. Um, does anyone have Second Corinthians? I don't think I went that far. Sacrifice. Uh, Hebrews 4.15. Probably not fast enough to beat in Hebrews, but anyone has it. Thank you. That's probably a favorite for many of you, um, as it is for me. And 1 John 3.5. Thanks, Terry. <clears throat> um, I think it, all those are self. Sure. Fourteen. What is the point of reasoning about the sacrifice of Christ? Is it to be accepted? I was going to look that up because I didn't even try to comment on the manual, and I did not write a note on that. Does anybody else have a have a stab there? Because I didn't even bring my copy of the book with me this morning. Colette, do you still have yours? There was a sentence in there in the way he spoke. Uh, he had a one sentence explanation with the uh, what they meant by reasonable, but I but I don't recall what it was, and I'm I'm sorry for that. It, in my notes, I got a question mark above recovery. It was this morning when I was going back. I didn't remember that either, but um. They didn't have a human soul as well. Yeah. And that's uh they go it's a good bit in the book if you uh of the early church. It's not relevant to um to our times now, but it is uh but but the author does a great in, in fact, um that kind of leads into the, the first point I was gonna make here because he he dwells a little bit on Catholicism. And I know we've got some even at Medivy people that come Catholic. So I, I don't have anything, anything negative, and uh, I remember the talking about that. From first, but uh, there's so there's a lot of steer some people away from wanting to study. When you think about these question and answer uh, things, people think mm, that's a little too. Uh, because I've had a couple of people say, you know, I've come back to a couple of hours. Children and I was, I was studying them with my kids, and at first I was the same way, but then I realized that I, I learned so much that, but it's just kind of catechism. I thought that that's not that it's not the church, but mm -hmm. I used it in questions and answers aid. It's a study aid, and it inspires us to, to memorize scripture, and that's how we ready ourselves for battle with the enemy is, is memorize scripture and, and we have it in our heart and our minds when the time comes. I remember Kim was uh, raised at this back then when we first heard the, uh, the creeds in, in church. And of course, on our overhead, they had a first conference. It always made her squirm to say Catholic <laughs> instead, of, instead, of, instead of universal. Yeah. Right. I mean, I, I kind of agree with the overall logic as far as uh, not changing the wording to bow to. Pressure in the, in the world as far as the Catholic Church and Catholic, but um, but I get that. So some of the same again, people have different viewpoints, but I think there are some that are they're still uncomfortable with the, the whole idea of catechizing ourselves. It's not like you know programming us. We talked about that in the introduction uh, weeks and weeks ago. 
Um, but so all that to say, there are there's going to be some some comparisons here. The author goes into that deeply uh, as far as the the comparisons with the Catholic Church, but not to pick on the Catholic faith just because there are some there's some wrong beliefs there about the virgin birth in particular. Instead of focusing on uh, birth, the, the incarnation of God in Christ Jesus, they tend to focus on the virgin and, and uh, glorifying Mary. And there's no doubt God chose her and uh, as his humble maidservant, but uh, his, his intent, I don't think, was to for her to be deified uh, like people tend to do. Um, so I think some of those things help in understanding the deity of Christ and um, and his humanity at the same time. Um, and you also have to take into take into account that the time when this council was was meeting in the 17th century, the Catholic Church was still very powerful. Um, and I think these guys boldly, um, at their own risk, charged out there and said, "Here's what Scripture says." Because I think the the Catholic Church at that time, because the you know the the status and the the point at the at which in history the the printing press was and the, the limited number of scripture and that kind of thing there weren't people that were as, as well read as what we have the opportunity to be today um so there were still a lot of uh relying on those that were preaching the word whether it be the catholic church or the protestant church um <clears throat> so again they're they're putting the attention the emphasis on mary um rather than on, on god uh, when they're not focused on the incarnation um and that that would be kind of like us taking credit uh there's no doubt that mary had a, a key role but that would be like us taking credit for the when god used, by his mercy uses us to accomplish good works um and that's what i meant earlier when uh, colette made a comment i uh, I want God to use me for good things, but I don't want to take credit for them because it uh, leads you down a path you don't want to go down. Um, if we're taking credit for those things, because I don't, I don't think we can accomplish anything good without, without Him being the author. And if we think that, then then we have to start questioning our motives. Just the way my mind works. Um, and also on that line, I was thinking this week as I was preparing, um, <clears throat> and this is, I guess, an example of what not to do, but. I remember when Pastor Francis was here to do our charge when, when Carrie and I were uh, ordained at the uh, various offices and George was being installed as a pastor. Uh, at the time, Pastor Francis asked me how I was doing for him because I hadn't seen him in a long time. And I said, I'm, I'm doing okay. I'm uncomfortable because I don't like being the center of attention. Anybody guess, want to guess what he said? You can guess. He said, well, well you're in luck, brother, because you're not the center of attention. <laughs> that's that's just his exact words and i remember to this day i didn't have to write it down and uh, he laughed just like he would and i said that that was well placed because in uh i mean i'm not feigning humility i don't like being the center of attention but you know if we if we take our focus off of christ and we're constantly pointing others when they're looking at us and even the right things that we do for his kingdom then then we're not we're not right-minded we're we're, if we're taking any of that credit or any of that glory, and um, I think by wrongly thinking that that I was the center of attention that day, uh, as he implied, um, I, I was doing that. It's kind of the same thing, and it, and it's an easy it's an easy uh, pitfall to to fall into. So, um, but in contrast, the Reformed faith, uh, the Evangelical Church, um, you know, we put the emphasis on the the birth, the incarnation. So, um, two common errors that others, and I, um, the author does cite Catholics again, the Catholic faith, the faith but also um, new believers, unbelievers, two common errors that they fall into. One would be associating or the notion of um, confusing the virginity of the virgin birth with sinlessness. I don't think there's anybody in here that falls into that category, but... Um, my understanding, and you guys that come from that background may be able to confirm what I was saying, but um, I believe that to have a sinless and holy child in Christ, that she had to be holy and sinless also, and that she was even a virgin indefinitely. And I don't, I'm not sure how that comes into play because, um, you know, not only did we know Jesus had four brothers, but 
this also goes speaks against scripture that that Paul uh, gives us in uh, in First Corinthians as far as the the husband and the wife honoring one another. Um, so I don't I don't fully all understand all that. I won't, I won't go down that road, Charlie. Well said. I give you the podium. Dead weeks passed. Thanks for that. Um, and I guess my faith is a childlike faith. I think. Well, the miraculous part of it is what is what also you could have that kind of, the contrast. I, Jason mentioned the word hypostasis. Hypostasis. I've been not in the seminary, but uh, I tend to think. Um, and I did look that up and, and read some more about it, but um, it's something that I can't. Um, I think of Christ, uh, his deity, and, and his humanity as being kind of a dichotomy because of the sharp contrast. Um, and that's what I love about it the miraculous nature of it, um, the sharp contrast in the nature of God being, being brought into one, into one person, one being. <coughs> Um, so that was the first one would be confusing those two things. The second pitfall that the, the author mentions is um, modernism. And again, any of those isms, I, I'll get in over my head quickly um, when we get beyond creationism. But, uh, you know, basically putting on a new spin on, on any old thing is the way I'm going to water that down um, as we try to get temper things to where they're, be, where they're acceptable to our modern culture. I, I, that's what I think of when I think of modernism. Um, and it takes the miraculous out of it. Uh, and when I think of modernism, I think of people like the ones that say, well, yeah, because people don't want to believe, but the ones that say, yeah, there was a, there was a party in the Red Seas, but it was at low tide and it was, here's what happened and the winds were just right and the water was shallow. And I mean, none of that stuff sounds miraculous to me. And that's those kind of beliefs and the same thing about the different views on the, on the flood and so on. Um, so I think that's another another major pitfall people fall into rather than taking God's word and, you know, the seven day, six day creation um, falling into those those traps of saying, well, here's how it could have really happened and trying to explain it to where it makes sense to our, our logical minds instead of taking it as it is, as God's word. Um, so those, a lot of those people also confuse what we said a couple weeks ago was the second best option. I heard another, a pastor talking about this again this week uh, about people choosing the, the second best option, which is, you know, evolution. Well, this is almost explainable, it's, even though it's a theory. Um, as they say in the uh, you know, sports world, there's, there's no, in that case, there's, it's probably true. There's no, uh, there's no second winner, only first loser. And that, that, <laughs> that theory is a, a loser because it's, it's not proven. <clears throat> Um, so again, missing the target uh, on the miracle, um, because I think if we try to make Mary more than she is, for example, we're trying to elevate in the in the, the deity and the humanity of Christ, rather than um, it wasn't bringing us up, mankind up to his level, it was bringing him down to our level, it was his whole point, of coming, coming to earth as a man, right, as a baby. So we, I think they, um, people have it backwards, the modernists. Um, 
we already read Luke 135, but the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Actually, maybe we didn't read that. I'm not going to on my page, page there, but what do you think that means when, uh, when the angel told uh, Mary that the power of the Most High would overshadow her? Uh, all right that bloodline as you said it was uh um and the author talks a good bit about this also but even in her sinful nature because she was still sinful the the holy spirit the power of the holy spirit is going to overcome that sinful nature and a and a, and a righteous uh, a sinless man will be born of her so um he took on mary's nature in becoming man but minus the sin right um the author also addresses the several the um, i guess heretical beliefs that uh, we talked about a, a few minutes ago but i'm not gonna um, go real deep into that i, I will um <clears throat> let's see i think we read one of those but hebrews 2 17 and 18 also <clears throat> therefore he had to be made like his brothers in every respect so that he might become merciful a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of god to make propitiation for the sins of the people for because he himself has suffered when tempted he is able to help those who are being tempted and this those verses, I think, are a nice transition um, section, but I wanted to, of course, which is on the, the three offices that he executes uh, because it addresses those there. But I'm in mean, 22 here before I, before I move on. Um, it may be simple for us to, because most of us have studied it, some of us all of our lives, as far as the deity and the humanity. Um, but I also wanted to mention I've never studied the larger catechism, but there was a couple of references in here um, because when I when we did the introduction a couple months ago, if you recall, we said that the the longer catechism, Westminster Catechism, was really designed for pastors to be able to use it to teach their congregations. I mean, you don't hear or see a lot of that happening now. And honestly, I've never studied. I don't think I've ever read through the the entire larger catechism. But um, he addresses in the book one of the questions here. And the question is, why was it requisite that the mediator should be God? I think any of us could probably put that in layman's terms right here. I won't put you on the spot. But this answer is so thorough that I want to read it. It says, <clears throat> make sure I start in the right place here. It was requisite that the mediator should be God, that he might sustain and keep the human nature from sinking under the infinite wrath of God and the power of death give worth and efficacy to his sufferings, obedience and intercession, and satisfy God's judgment, procure his favor, purchase a peculiar people, give his spirit to them, conquer all their enemies, and bring them to everlasting salvation. That's pretty thorough, isn't it? It goes through the whole, the whole plan of salvation. And I, I'm not advocating for any of us going home and studying that, uh, but it's just, it was very thorough and um, I found it powerful. So that the reason I read it though is that that would be an impossibility for anybody but God to mediate for us and accomplish all that, right? I mean, I someone could try to go go to mediate for us, but I, if you recall back in Zechariah in third chapter when we were studying that, I don't remember when it was last summer or last spring. Um, when Zechariah uh, has this vision and. And the high priest is standing condemned before God, condemned by Satan, and the angel of the Lord, Christ, is there to mediate for him because no one else is the high, the high priest um, representing uh, Israel at that point um, before the time of uh, Christ actually coming to earth. So Christ is our high priest, and that's um, where we'll transition here to question 23. If you guys can get ready to look up some more of these scriptures, I would I would appreciate it. Um, what offices does Christ execute as our Redeemer? Christ is our Redeemer, executeth the offices of a prophet, of a priest, and of a king, both in his estate of humiliation and exaltation. 
And if you guys looked ahead, anybody that looked ahead has has any of these, you see the proofs there. Deuteronomy 18:18. Okay. Very good. Does anyone have Acts? That's Acts 2.33 if you, when you get it. Uh, yes. Okay. Again, the office of prophet. Does anyone? Well, I have uh, Hebrews one. I put me down. Long ago, many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom he also created the world. Um, does anyone have Hebrews 4, 14 and 15? Since then, we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, that is both fast to our confession, not a priest who is Thank you. And Isaiah 9, 6 and 7. Thank you. Beautiful. Does anyone have Luke 1? It will be great to recall the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and his kingdom will never end. Thank you. I could read these all day. Does anyone have John 18? Thank you. Does anyone else have First Corinthians fifteen? For you must away and stand and put off the man which is the beginning of the sin. Thank you, Stan. Okay. He must in order to accomplish his purpose, right? Thank you all. And this is not a difficult concept for most of us, um, but I do love, uh, love reading through the, through the proofs. Um, we'll see several things in this, uh, or we do see several things in this in the proofs. Um, our original state at creation, um, the Old Testament history of preparation, which is pretty much all of this, right? preparation of his plan of redemption, the saving work of Christ, um, our conversion, which we'll talk a little bit more at the at the end of the lesson, um, and the mark of the church, as we were talking about a couple of us earlier here, what what, uh, what does the church of Christ look like? And um, when God created us, we had, we said a couple weeks ago, we had true knowledge, um, we had righteousness, holiness, um, until the fall and the author makes the point that we were in essence Adam was in essence a prophet priest and a king and uh, his dominion in that uh, as he was created in the uh, before the fall 
you know, but after that we became ignorant, guilty and and sinful. And um if you flip over to the to the back of that, this is I don't want to take credit for that. Uh but <clears throat> this this little table here and I'll I'll reference some of this, but the the author had put this together. I liked it because uh He's kind of categorizing everything, obviously, as prophet, priest, and king, and how each of these serves, what, what man looked like as he was created before the fall in that first uh, row. Then the way we are now, um, Israel, how Israel executed the offices of prophet, priest, and king in their history, then how Christ still does execute those uh, after after the work of the cross, and then um, how how converted man, how how we, I said we up here when I was talking about man as we are now, I, I meant before we're reborn. Um, and then, of course, the true church, which I had never thought about this, but um, we were talking about, uh, well, various things and, uh, and and what the church looks like and how, how difficult this is for, um, you know, for the church and our, our pastors, leaders, and so on to to meet and exercise those uh, those offices uh, holy as as we as our vows indicate when we when we take those vows when we join the church um, these are these are difficult times um, presently and I and I don't mean difficult as in woe is us but they're certainly making a challenge in this uh, in this modern age to to worship uh, according to God's word. Um, <clears throat> So the Old Testament, there are some, you know, blurry lines. If you go back before Abraham about the offices of prophet, priest, and king, you don't, we don't think about that as much until the, until the time of Christ. But we do see that Abraham, even he was certainly a prophet. And was well, somebody, I think Wayne was just reading one of those in Deuteronomy, but in Genesis 20, we see that he's a prophet. He was somewhat of a priest too in his, in his family in chapter 13 of Genesis and I'm not going to read each one of these um, in lieu of time, but in Genesis 14, we see that he was somewhat of a king too, although I don't think it ever calls him that, but he's defeating these kingdoms and addressing all these kings and so on. So at least in the sense of what the word means. Um, but then when his nation become his family becomes a nation, when God makes them as numerous as the stars, um, those start, those start getting divided up and you see the, the priests officially assigned um, and kings even ultimately when the uh, people demand that. I love what the altar says about the, the offices though, these three offices. He says, through faithful prophets, God gave his true word, the men that were, through the men that were carried along by the Holy Spirit. Through faithful priests, God showed how there could be no forgiveness without the shedding of blood. And through faithful kings, God showed how his people were to obey him in all things. And the flip side of that, the author makes the point that he used unfaithful prophets, unfaithful priests, unfaithful kings, also for his glory, as, as we know he does all things, using them to realize that, to, to make people, even us today, realize that there wouldn't be any salvation without those offices being executed perfectly and that in the, in the form of Christ. <clears throat> um, I also like the points he makes about the um, about the church, and and you can see him right there in front of you. A true church ex exercises faithful preaching of the word, um, the right administration or faithful administration of the sacraments uh, of baptism and the, the Lord's supper, and proper exercise of church discipline. Now, I would say that if you're and that's why we, we focus on that here at Metaview and in, in most of the evangelical church, we, we focus on the, the faithful preaching of the word, because if you have faithful preaching of the word, everything else should be subsequent to that, right? We shouldn't, it shouldn't be that easy to derail us. But again, we talked about modernism and these other things earlier that, that confuse us. And I can't speak for you guys, but I, I am easily confused by society. You hear enough of something in the, in the news or from your, your professors at university and all this stuff that it, till it starts it starts resonating and you start thinking, well, maybe we should include this group or we should do this. And uh, that, that, that's an easy pitfall for, for me personally. Um, so, uh, and I, I won't 
go too far down that rabbit trail, but that's that's why, you know, just thinking about what I was just alluding to the, the church today and what our what our pastors and our our shepherds, our leaders are are facing. Um, how do you faithfully execute all those all these components? I mean, we can call it fellowship. This this class is uh, is fellowship, and we're studying God, and we're two or more are gathered in His name. There He'll be also, but it's not. This is not worship. This is not the, you know, in this room. If this were somewhere off, uh, off campus, then it wouldn't necessarily be the Church of Christ in itself without the the execution, faithful execution of those offices and discipline and those things that we take as as vows when we join the church. Um, so those things are. Um, you know, there's some there's some challenges today. Um, but if we believe all these things, the things that we accept when we do our vows, uh, then you know we sh- shouldn't necessarily have trouble. You know, getting volunteers. We should all be wanting to line up and, and uh, volunteer for the various ministries that are allowed, and and be disciplined when we when we misbehave because we all do misbehave, uh, and those are those are all part of the church, and that's what the the point the author is making it's not advocating that um you know for for anything other than this is this is what the church should look like with respect to the three offices prophet priest and king that even the church executes those offices enough about that um what do you see in a church that doesn't uh, what happens to a church that doesn't faithfully preach the word of of god what happens to it ultimately i mean anything become secular and frequently you see those um dying out and we're not talking about numbers because it's not really uh, i'm only speaking for myself but it's not really important what the size of a uh, uh, the size of a a church body is Uh, it's only important that you're we're following god's word right because the rest is up to him Um, just like paul and apollos you know you can plant the seeds but it's up to god to 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 grow things so um but i think frequently you see that the landscapes littered with um congregations that are dwindling from those inclusionist movements and the things like that and and i myself have uh have had exposure to that a little where um i remember a family years ago that um, left a a particular church uh, because of something they didn't like that they heard from the pulpit and i imagine each one of you have a story like that uh, but it was it was scriptural what was being said and um, they didn't say well you know down with your church they just quietly left and here's why but if you're not you're not preaching those things that are, are faithful to scripture then then what do you have uh, if you're just trying to include everyone it's not uh, it's it's not about that so Because of that uncommon to two on the common ground with other people. And but I was thinking about in our case we we got we were blessed in a lot of ways with friends that were special. <laughs> but I find myself really not wanting to be around someone who Mm-hmm. But but anyway, it's 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 very difficult for, for me to <coughs> cozy up to friends who are a bit far away from what she and I feel like we should be doing. 
thank you for that. I, I agree. And I think, uh, I can't remember your opening statement there, but I think it's it's always difficult, even if they're completely unbelievers. I mean, we're called to still love them. So, but I do, I, I mentioned the old saying about, um, you know, anyway, I won't say it the way I did then about the, the dogs and the fleas, but we do have to be careful who we hang around with because we're susceptible to that too, even as believers, because you we are impacted by that. Yes, the dog is dead. It was just about laying down with dogs and getting up with fleas, but I was afraid. It's, I'm afraid it sounds offensive uh, because nobody has more fleas than me. <laughs> That's not an excuse. It seems like it's easier to hang out with someone who claims to be a non Christian than it is with someone who, in my opinion, butchers. Well, and it's an easy, uh, it's an easy trap to fall into because, um, you know, and the, one of the terms you hear a lot is, is meeting people where they're at and there's nothing wrong with that term and there's nothing wrong with meeting people where they're at as long as you don't end up going down that road because we're still tasked also with supporting scripture. We as, as believers, each, each of us. Um, with <laughs> Inclusion. I didn't want to go in there by myself. But yeah. Anyway, uh, what was interesting was uh, a great guy, a great man. And he was a member of First Methodist down there. The service was at Freedom Baptist, which is a very fundamental kind. And another fundamental Baptist church. And then he was buried at uh, Falls Chapel out on West Central Virginia. And I was thinking to myself, man, how did they get all that together? <laughs> <laughs> I found out, I didn't even know this, I found out that it was later here that one of those Baptist preachers led him to Christ. Hmm. And the other one was very close to him. And so on. So it's almost like I'm excusing myself from what I said earlier about not really feeling good about hanging around with folks that don't agree with me if they're far left to the fault. And then lo and behold, here's, here's a situation where a guy, I mean, he wasn't uh, in your face with me. He initiated a conversation with one of those pastors because 
something he heard him say. Anyway, he heard me and he said, I want to talk more about that. Hmm. In a night, he, he heard a sound of something like this. Hmm. Like that. I don't know what y'all said that triggered that in my memory, but I was thinking back to something Jason said about he wasn't worried about uh, atheists. But when he was saying that, I didn't jump in last week, but I was thinking about uh, uh, Christ telling the, the Pharisee, you, you, the, the, you're close to the kingdom of God you know, with, with what you're saying. And I think that's true. Um, you know, you, you frequently see that God using atheism and any other number of tools to, to convert people, Josh. Uh, McDowell, I mentioned, but there's there's a host of people that are trying to disprove it and approve the faith, but that's a little diversion from what you were saying. And I got pretty far off track there, but um, back to, uh, well, it, it makes it more interesting if we, uh, if you guys participate, then, then listen to me drawn on, but uh, but prophet, priest, and king, and the, and the part of our, um, you know, what, what part do we, do we play in that? We, we know that we talked about free uh, freedom versus liberty, and um, and it's it's kind of a confusing doctrine for a, for a lot of people. But we know the Christ that work uh, the work that Christ did, um, and God's plan of salvation. So the author makes the point, and he probably, he expounds on it a little more than I will because I like you know Romans ten nine, confess with your mouth and believe in your heart. But the author says. Uh, the things that that we have to do we, we've got to know christ uh, his word only the things that the spirit can teach us uh his personal state of sin and misery that being mine the the, the new believer and that christ is is the only remedy he also has to feel a personal need for repentance um, and finally he has to cease uh, cease living that as a slave to sin um, So, prophet, priest, and king. Um, I'm glad we we had the opportunity and the time to go through the the scripture references because I think again that's that's the most important thing. And I appreciate y'all's y'all's patience. Let's go ahead and uh, close in prayer. And if you guys want to stay around for another minute or two, we can. Father God, I just thank you again for these um, these brothers and sisters for this time in your word. Father, for the for the freedom to be in your word without fear of persecution. We thank you for the true church, Father, and for faithful faithfulness to your word, Father, um, here at Metaview and across America and, and around the world, Father. And we can see the, the spread of the gospel so that we know we know that it's out there and just pray for um, for encouragement for for those men and women that are out there uh, spreading your word today, Father, in the field. And um especially those under fear of persecution and death even. Um, as difficult as it can be for us to, to understand how you you humbled yourself, uh, Father, and, um, and came to earth as a, as a baby, we, um, we see the promise in your word and we give you praise for that. Uh, we acknowledge you as our, our prophet, priest, and king, Father. Um, may we exalt Christ in everything that we do and say today. May we execute the, the faithful preaching of the word, the administration, the sacraments, the, the church discipline, all, all to bring honor to you, Father, and staying faithful to your word. I just pray that you go with us as we enter worship this morning. I'll be with Taylor as he delivers the gospel to us, and uh, may our praises be a sweet sound to your ear. Pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you all.